right. So I'm Christy Strauss, um, operations manager for Film Inquiry. So welcome. This is the uh, first Film Inquiry roundtable. And uh, we're going to chat about movies, do a little trivia, and hopefully bring some joy. <laughs> um, hope everyone's doing well, staying sane, healthy. And uh, yeah, so I'm in Maine, just to kind of give that introduction. Um, and yeah, I'm doing pretty good. I'm hanging in there. So let's start with uh, Menno. Hi, hello. Nice to see everyone and hope everyone's hanging in there. Um, I'm uh, editor-in-chief and founder of Film Inquiry, and I'm currently based in Texas. Uh, you might notice I have a little accent, and that's because I was born and raised in the Netherlands. So that's, uh, that's my story. And uh, yeah, I'd like to pass it on to whoever wants to introduce him next. I can go. So uh, I'm Kevin. I am from California right now. I'm holding out pretty good as well. And I, I've been with Film Inquiry for um, over a year now, maybe two years now. And I got to say, it's probably one of the best decisions I've ever made. So I'm happy to be here. Hello, everyone. I am Emily. I am the writer's coordinator for Film Inquiry. And um, I'm in Indiana. And as far as how everything is going, I'm just holding, holding out and trying to stay sane. Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Jake Tropila, editor, writer, film inquiry. Um, inquiry. Uh, I've been with the site for almost two years, and I love it. Uh, I'm currently coming out of uh, sunny Southern California, uh, Los Angeles, to be exact, and uh, happy to be here and happy to talk with you guys. I'm uh, I'm Danny Anderson, and I'm from I've been I think about a year or so I've been writing for the for the magazine, which I love. I appreciate every opportunity they give me. Um, I'm from Cleveland, Ohio originally. I live in kind of the middle of nowhere, Pennsylvania, right now. So um, nicely tucked away from all the danger. Uh, I'm Jesse Nussman. Uh, I'm here in North Carolina, and I'm probably the newbie of the group because I've only been with Film Inquiry for, gosh, is it like three or four months now? Every day is just folding into one day at this point. So that, that's about where I am, is <laughs> just hunkered down in uh, my apartment with one day feeling like the, the, the last three days. Yeah, I think we're kind of all there. <laughs> um, I'm not. I mean, really have sure. we heard from Mark yet? Oh yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, hi. Uh, I'm Mark McPherson. Uh, I'm based out of uh, Minnesota, right around, close to Minneapolis here. Uh, I've been writing on the site for about a year now, and it's uh, been pretty cool. So I've just been just holding up here as best I can. It's I'm doing all right, but yeah, everyone else just struggling. So. Awesome. Um, so thank you everybody for being here and taking this time and sharing. And uh, also love your background, Mark. Just wanna point that out. Um, so yeah, so obviously, you know, I've, I've been with Home and Cree for a while and I love it. It's my favorite thing. So I really love seeing you guys, a lot of you for the first time interacting. I'm really hopeful, hoping that everybody has a fun time. So I'm gonna ask the first question and I guess you guys can just feel free. I don't know if we remember the order that just happened, but if you want to try that again, um, as far as answering, feel free. So the first question is what, cause this is all about movies that kind of like in our lives, like what shaped us. So the first film that you remember seeing, whether that be in the theater or just the first one that left because not everybody remembers I mean the first movies they saw necessarily but the first one that left an imprint and or in theater if you don't remember you know which, which whichever so my first movie that I remember making an imprint when I was young was E.T. so 
Right on. Yeah, so I actually do remember the um, first movie, well, two movies I went to see in the uh, in the cinema and, and might make you wonder why I ever became a film fan, but the first one I ever saw in theaters was Big Daddy uh, with Adam Sandler. <laughs> And this was a big deal for me at the time because my my mom and her friend they went to the 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 theater like the big adult movie next door and then uh, me and my little friends we were all allowed to go and see the other like the the kids film which was an an Adam Sandler film um, in the next theater so that was uh, I, I guess it it contributed to why I'm weird so here we are. I can go next. So one thing I definitely know about myself is ever since I was a little kid, I am a diehard dinosaur fanatic. I, I loved uh, reading picture books of dinosaurs. I loved learning about each one. So I remember the first film um, that really resonated with me ever since I was a child was the original Land Before Time. Probably one of the most rewatched film I've seen. And one of the first live action films and first PG-13 films I've seen was Jurassic Park. So both of those really made an impact on me. And hilariously, probably the first film I remember seeing in theaters was um, that dinosaur film that Disney put out with the, where they were trying to go for the realistic animation. And I remember thinking that was the most amazing thing I've ever seen in my life. Uh, that was back then, at least, that was the most impressive animation ever. And seeing it again a couple of weeks ago, I think there's still parts of the animation that holds up. So, yeah, that's mine. Do you want to keep the Don Bluth train going here? Um, the 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 first one I can remember seeing in the theater was um, uh, All Dogs Go to Heaven, um, and I believe that's like that was right around the time, like because after that I saw Land Before Time, um, and I remember. When I went to go was when I was going to go see it, I was watching a lot of television cartoons. And originally, I thought because it was about dogs, I thought it was going to be this cartoon I watched on television called nobody remembers this. It's called like Rude Dog and the Dweebs. It's a very forgettable cartoon from the eighties. But for some reason, I thought that was going to be the the movie we were going to see, and we ended up seeing this film about uh, a gangster dog who dies and comes back from the dead. Um, so yeah, between that and Land Before Time, there were a lot of films about um, uh, about death that that, uh, that I focused on, and it was kind of like sobering there because I guess it kind of prepared me for you know later in life when my brother and I would just watch every single Nightmare on Elm Street and Friday the Thirteenth film. So uh, thanks, Bluth. <laughs> well, piggybacking off of uh, oh sorry, but uh, piggybacking off of early movie experiences that probably taught us about death. Uh, my first experience was seeing um, the like Disney animated Tarzan movie when I was a kid. And I truthfully don't really remember much about the movie. I've, I've, I think I got the story of Tarzan in my head. Like he, he's raised by the, the apes out in the jungle. Um, but I do have a very distinct memory of my dad taking me out of the theater and us walking to the car and him just like leaning down at me and be like, so what did, what did you think? And, and I'm just like bawling, crying because the, uh, the main uh, the gorilla that raises Tarzan is killed at the end of the movie. And so like my dad is trying, is having to like drag this like crying four year old out of the theater back to the car who's just bawling be like, the gorilla died, he died. Uh, carrying on the uh, the Disney animated um, train here, I tried to rack my brain and see what the first film I remember seeing in the theater was. I summed it up. It was one of the Disney animated movies. It was either Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs or Beauty and the Beast or The Lion King. Um, so I grew up in a very Disney-fied household, I guess you could say, as a youth. And I had, I had two younger sisters as well. So any one of those were always, always seemed to be on repeat. Uh, so I'll say... Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs was probably the first that I remember seeing. Um, and I remember the witch being very scary at the end of that movie. That was very young Jake experience. As far as the first movie I saw in theater, 
Um, definitely the first one I can remember is actually, again, still Animals and Disney, is the Homeward Bound remake from the 90s. And the reason I distinctly remember it is because uh, my mom ended up sobbing because the cat goes over a waterfall and she thought the cat had died. So my mom ended up crying. So me at like five years old was so upset seeing my mom cry that I, it's just a, such a distinct memory. But then of course I ended up crying by the end of that movie. So same boat, it sounds like it's a lot of people just crying over animals dying. Gosh, I feel I'm older, I think, than everybody else. I'm an Xer. And so um, I, but I also grew up in a really weird, like, religious tradition that we weren't allowed to go to movies, like to the theater, but we could watch movies at home, sort of. And, um, and so the last movie I remembered seeing in the theater was at a drive in. It was Godzilla versus Megalon. Um, if you can remember that, I was little. I mean, I, I just barely have memories of it. Um, but then when I finally went to the movie theater, it was actually Jurassic Park. Uh, and so that to me was the uh, the two the bookends of that experience. And in the middle, for me, I guess growing up when I did like the late night horror host was really big in Cleveland. We had a few um, different local channels that had horror hosts and the one on Friday night, big Chuck and little John, they would always play like those hammer uh, horror films and the Basil Rathbone, Sherlock Holmes movies. Um, and so like a mixture of that. And then on Saturday afternoon, super hosts would play Godzilla movies. And that, that was to me my entire childhood. So, yeah. Well, anyone who knows Godzilla versus Megalon it instantly <laughs> like high five because because the, <laughs> the whole drop kick scene is like one of the best scenes ever in all of cinema i, I was like were, this i knew big. he was gonna again say something <laughs> that's like kevin's uh definitely his his world i knew you had to say something about that yep yep he might I do well work. with a uh, particular trivia question i have later then oh <laughs> okay hey come on i thought no uh no tips here I got to tease out a little bit, you know, we got to keep the audience goosed for what's to come. Yes. Yes, it's true. So I wanted to uh, also elaborate too. E.T. was one of mine, a lot of Disney movies. I mean, I remember seeing Bambi for the first time. Ouch. But um, yeah, E.T. just really like, I don't know, for some reason that movie, even now when I watch it, I like feel like I did when I was a kid watching it. And I like, it's almost like it traumatized me, but it, in, a, in a good way, because it's an amazing movie. Um, and Homeward Bound, geez, if I watch that now, I probably like when the dog comes over at the end, the hill, and you, you think he's dead and he's not, I, I still think I'd that would probably wreck me. Anything with animals is just like, it's hard. So uh, thank you all for sharing that. So kind of in a similar vein and, you know, Obviously, there's so many, so just try to, the ones that come to your head first. Um, what movies, maybe after childhood, or still in childhood, but what movies do you feel really shaped you the most as a film fan? Like, the ones that really made their imprint and, and shaped who you are in your film identity. Um, for me, you know, I love, I love Martin Scorsese. I saw Goodfellas, probably too young, uh, and The Godfather, and those both of those movies, I think it's because my family didn't watch a lot of movies, but for some reason, the movies that my parents loved are the really good ones. So I guess that means something. But yeah, so that really stood out to me. And then when I was a teenager, um, Fight Club, Requiem for a Dream, Magnolia, um, those Boogie Nights even, and unfortunately, I say American Beauty now, but at the time, you know, who could know? what was going to come but you know a lot of those movies really shaped me as far as a film fan and I feel like there's probably a thousand others that <laughs> I'm not thinking of but I think those are the ones that kind of Donnie Darko too but um just kind of be I like iconic in my in my teenage like formative years I suppose as far as really shaping me and then obviously all of those movies led me down <laughs> so many other paths and um Oh, Taxi Driver 2. So, next. Yeah, I'd be happy to go next because uh, actually you mentioned a lot of the films that um, sort of shaped me too as a film fan. Like, uh, 
you know, Donnie Darko, Fight Club, especially Seven as well, which still to this day, one of my favorite films. Uh, also very much The Matrix, especially the first one. Um, that kind of sort of messed me up a little, I guess, because it started wondering about like, is the world real? Like that, th like, you know, that thing that you start thinking about when you're like early teens and yeah, no, that wasn't good. Also, I saw Requiem for a Dream was when I was like 12. I think it honestly like scared me away from drugs forever for that reason. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm sort of grateful too. Um, Spirited Away and also Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, which I know is uh, compared to uh, Requiem for a Dream. It's, it's sort of interesting to pair them together, but uh, yeah, it's there. And uh, horror films in general, like I've, I watch so many horror films and, um, <laughs> oh, there's my cat. Um, yeah, just in general, I couldn't even think about specific titles. I was thinking The Shining is probably one of the most significant ones for me uh, in, in the horror genre. And, and um, so yeah, that, that's a, a number of them and, and probably, every dystopian science fiction film out there, so. Me too for The Shining, just to throw that out there. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll happily um, carry this uh, thread along. I, a lot of the same movies you two mentioned are also in my list, and I was really thinking, I would say probably like when I was 13 or 14 is when I started to get into serious cinema, and I, you know, I hate how pretentious that sounds, but it's, it's true, and um, so a lot of uh, 1970s Hollywood uh, really shaped my interests. So you have The Godfather, um, you have Taxi Driver, you have Apocalypse Now. Um, I watched A Clockwork Orange a lot. I was I read the book several times. I was like I became fluent in the the NADSAT slang. <laughs> I'm embarrassed to say, um, but in movies like Jaws and uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, and then also a lot of more. Uh, contemporary films like uh, Manon mentioned, like uh, The Matrix and Fight Club were definitely two big ones of mine. Um, but yeah, 70s Hollywood, I think. And it's also an interesting to look back at like the landscape of cinema and see how once the, the production code ends and like all these new wave films are coming out and just sort of changing the world and how cinema is made. It's just kind of interesting to come of age through that period. And I still regard it as probably the best era of film that we've ever had. So go 70s, that's what I say. So uh, I, I think I owe my, my taste in film uh, to three titles that I can think of at, at the moment. First is the Lord of the Rings trilogy, absolutely. Um, I think that needs no explanation though. <laughs> um, one of the few films where really, I think every, every film department in that is at their A game. And it's like the planets aligning really in terms of the craft done to that. Um, the second title uh, would be Pan's Labyrinth. And I think maybe I saw it at right at the time when I was um, studying filmmaking in, in high school and middle school. And I think that film really um, had an impact on me because it was the first where uh, it took something that I was pretty familiar with because I grew up because you know, we all grew up with fairy tales, but it was the first one that really flips it over its head, gives it such a dark, twisted, but mature look at it. And it really helped me understand, wow, there is so much potential in the kinds of stories you can tell, even if it's a genre that you've seen so many times before. Right. And then the last one that definitely affected uh, me ever since childhood is My Neighbor Totoro. And uh, I, which I think that film has been scientifically proven to cure depression. Like whenever I feel down, whenever whenever I need something to put a smile on my face, I'll, I'll put that movie up and um, works like a charm every single time. And I think the other reason why that film really, uh, really affected me, really shaped who I am was, I think that was one of the first films I've, I saw that was foreign and I think maybe that really opened my uh, flexibility and just open-mindedness to watch something that's foreign, something that's not in English, you know. And it helped me understand that film is a universal thing. It's a, it, it spans across multiple cultures. I want to jump on the Miyazaki train, I guess. Um, 
Because like one of the the films I remember, the one film I remember that made me like get involved seriously with film was um, Princess Mononoke, and that's mainly because um, I, I remember like that was like the first anime that I ever saw in the theater, um, and I remember I was starting to get big into it at the time, and I remember I had to seek it out. Like any anyone from that era, you know, who saw it in the theater, they they'll tell you stories about how they would travel like three or four hours just to go see this film. Um, so I, and I remember just being mesmerized. Like I left, like I left the theater and it's one of those experiences where I imagine like when people came out of like 2001, a space odyssey where they're just like, you know, like they feel like they've left the world. Now they have to return to it and you, you have to find your way back and you, and you kind of don't want to find your way back. You just want to go back into the theater. So I ended up seeing the film three more times that weekend and, uh, failing some homework I had that weekend that I can't remember. Uh, so yeah, I, I actually really sought this film out. Like I, I sought out for, for theatrical screenings. I remember I bought this soundtrack immediately once I could find it. Um, I think it took almost like a year to come out on DVD, but it was weird because you could, it came out on VHS, but you had to wait on DVD because they were trying to get the Japanese audio on there. So I remember I was like hounding the video store for when I could rent it on VHS and then hounding the, the other video store for when I could buy it on DVD. Um, and since then, I've gotten really into Miyazaki, and I've gotten really more into um, uh, seeking out films. Because after that point, like, I remember my my mom would, uh, you know, help me out by like driving down uh, to these art house theaters to seek out more foreign films, more anime, and more films that didn't usually get a wide release. So that's about the time when I started taking it seriously. I guess I'll go. I mean. You guys all have such great taste, and yeah, I, I echo all of them. The '70s were a really big when I first started discovering movies and going back to it. That was a big one for me. So, like everything with Al Pacino in it from the '70s was like big on my list, right? And um, but I guess my favorite movie is um, American Werewolf in London, and uh, and so it's it's obviously one that I just the mix of horror and comedy was like really kind of um, formative for me. But like also in that same kind of time zone. I've seen it a million times and I, I never stopped loving it. Silver Bullet, um, the Gary Busey's the uncle of, of Corey Haim and there's a werewolf chasing them and stuff. So uh, that's a that's a movie I really love. Um, but, you know, uh, Better Off Dead is one of my favorites. Oopsie. Drop my iPad. Uh, Better Off Dead is one of my favorites there from uh, from the 80s. Um, but then, you know, I really started getting into all this stuff in the 90s. And so, like, The Usual Suspects was was really big for me. When that came out, I went and saw it, like, 20 times. Um, and, uh, yeah, and The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. I mean, I could go on, but you guys have already hit tons of movies that are really important to me. But, yeah, those are some some big ones for me. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's uh... – at definitely a lot of stuff you guys have already mentioned i mean i i had my dad showing me spielberg movies when i was really little like on days when i was sick and he would just be like all right we're gonna watch jaws or raiders today and you, you know when i was getting into high school a cousin of mine being like hey here's all of these like cool independent movies that were coming out when i was your age in like the late 90s and early 2000s and um you know i i good i'm just racking through all the different movies in my head and trying to get down to more concise picks but i mean goodfellas is something that i'm constantly re-watching it's probably my favorite movie i mean every six months or so i probably rewatch it and there's something else that i'm tuned into whether it's the music whether it's individual shots whether it's the performances way whether it's the way scorsese is moving the camera around in order to showcase emotion um i just think it's such a great you can break that movie apart into so many pieces and figure out kind of what what makes great movie making. Um, and then the, the last thing I'll mention is the kind of collective works of David Lynch was really big on me when I was in high school and just being like, okay, here is a, a cinematic language that does not have to function in a kind of the normal sort of logic beats of storytelling that I'm used to. And is so much so in tune with kind of these very visceral emotions that I can get, whether it's something that's just sort of like absurdly funny or like blue, blue velvet was a movie that like really, really upset me when I, I was probably like 16 when I saw that and it really, really messed me up. Um, and even just like Mulholland drive, the idea of like walking out of a movie and 
um, my cousin that I mentioned earlier and him being like, so what did you think? And I was like, what? explain to me the ending. And he's like, that's, that's the point right there is you, you got to do the work for that yourself. And that just being something that I was just totally alien to me. And I, I think has helped uh, at least solidify for me kind of what I'm looking for in, in an experience and what sort of movie experiences really stand out for me. Yeah, for me, I would say the first time I really started thinking about movies was when my older brother started bringing movies to me, which would have been around 2000. So movies like um, Being John Malkovich or The Royal Tenenbaums or Unbreakable, like these were the movies that my, brothers, my brother was bringing to me and then we would just have long conversations about them. So I would say those movies right around that time was really when I started thinking about filmmaking itself. All really awesome choices. It kind of makes me want to go back and say, just say all of the above, like everything that everybody just mentioned. I'm, I'm good. I, I actually, Spielberg was huge, Pulp Fiction and Lord of the Rings too. I just felt like I was thinking of some of those while you guys were talking. And thanks for the uh, Silver Bullet. I feel like nobody knows that movie. Good old Stephen King uh, adaptation. <laughs> I actually own that movie. It's, uh, it's definitely amusing. So um, yeah, so the next question is, um, what movie or TV show, whatever, do you think, you know, that you wouldn't, people wouldn't expect you to like something, um, I, you could, you know, say guilty pleasure, but just something that maybe is unexpected. Uh, for me, like, I don't really like reality TV, but I love Survivor. I've watched that show since it, like, first started. <laughs> and uh, I don't know, people seem to think that's weird when I've told some people that, but it's just... Uh, I don't know. It's a lot of fun. It's also really fun to binge when you're self quarantined. But um, yeah, so yeah, I'll I'll jump straight straight onto that because I was also thinking about reality TV. I don't like reality TV, but I am a huge Deadliest Catch fan. <laughs> um, so I really enjoy that. I think it's the purest horror on the entire world. <laughs> so yeah. I also have watched both of those shows in my time. I am currently watching the season of Survivor and talking about it a lot on Twitter, even though no one seems to care about it. Um, <laughs> uh, but I would add to that, I am a big fan of the show Once Upon a Time, which I think most people, most of the time I'm not into like really princess stuff, but that has such a camp factor. I was always into it. I'll go. Um, so for movies, I, I I don't know why this movie, it's just sort of a tradition for me at this point. Um, the Sandra Bullock movie, While You Were Sleeping, is uh, one of my go-to movies. I watch it religiously every year with my wife. Um, but I, I actually, like I introduced her to it before we, when, once we got married um, because it was a movie I, I kind of stumbled into the theater and saw and just loved. And it's got a very almost like lifetime quality aesthetic to it. But um, it's just a movie I could never stop watching enough. I love that. And for TV shows... Um, this is a guilty pleasure because it can be kind of mean spirited, I think, sometimes, but just for pure fun. It used to be on True TV. It was a show called World's Dumbest, where they had like a bunch of like hacky comedians and B little celebrities making fun of people klutzing out on video. And I don't know, just I, I am a little ashamed of liking that movie, I have to say, or show. I'll continue on the, the movie, uh, the movie train. Um, most people who, who know me. Uh, know that I'm a really, really happy person. I love, always excited to to do something that I've never done before. And so most people don't think that I would enjoy depressing movies or really, really uh, harrowing stuff. And I like to come out straight and say I'm very mixed on Lars von Trier and Gaspar Noel. That being said, I really like Melancholia and I really love part one of Nymphomaniac. I think those two films are there's something about those two films that completely work for me in terms of Lars von Trier's wavelength and my wavelength com coming together. I think maybe it's the humor and the editing style of, of Nymphomaniac Part 1 and the, the uh, something about the atmosphere 
and the the irony of uh, Charlotte Gainsbourg's character and Chris, Kirsten Dunst's characters reversing in Melancholia that made me feel like it worked really well. But other than that, most of his other films I'm not a fan of. <laughs> Oh, I guess. Uh, oh, you want to go yeah. redhead? Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, um, I, I guess like you know, since I tend to gravitate towards like you know a lot of um, you know, like like the the more the more fantastical stuff. Um, I've kind of it, it kind of surprises people when when sometimes I tell them I'm into sort of the um the very low key um science fiction. So like one of my favorite science fiction films that is so minimal is uh, is Stalker. Um, and Stalker is a film that has like very, like almost like barely any special effects at all. And it mostly relies on a lot of imagination um, and touches on just like a lot of like deep aspects of existentialism and, you know, contemplating the afterlife. Um, and there are a whole bunch of different films like this I've found that are weird. Stuff like uh, it's, it's it's hard to be a god and um, how is that a November? There's a whole bunch of like these like just low grade, you know, down and dirty, simplistic imaginative sci-fi films that I really adore. Um, and I guess for like a guilty pleasure TV show that I kind of dug back in the back in my college days, we used to watch this really horrible show called Who Wants to Be a Superhero, which was it, it aired on the sci-fi channel for like one season. And it was just it was just a bunch of people pretending that they were auditioning for being a superhero and they were given these like really ridiculous stunts. Everyone was overacting. But it's like, you know, if we were going to watch reality television where we knew people were acting, they might as well be overacting, you know, as much as they can. So we, I really dug watching that show. That sounds a lot of fun. I might actually want to watch that. Stan Lee hosted it. It's pretty cool. Oh. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's the judge on the show. <laughs> um, yeah, so... Uh... With guilty pleasures, um, which is a term I don't really like, I don't feel guilty about anything I like. Um, but uh, one series of films, I guess you could say, that get trashed by critics a lot, or I'm I'm a big fan of Bloomhouse's horror movies. Um, I love their business model. You know, make a five million dollar feature and it makes like forty, fifty million dollars, and it's really just these filmmakers flexing their genre muscles and I, I i enjoy them a great deal i like your unfriended i like your happy death days um i especially like truth or dare and fantasy island i think i don't think a movie necessarily has to you know be objectively good to be a good time i you know i find myself a lot more satisfied watching those movies than say i don't know your two and a half hour marvel movies it's just a more just they're just more fulfilling for me um as far Wait, as TV you, shows, oh. you had you had me you had me until Truth or Dare. Come on, Truth or Dare is great. That is a go back <laughs> I've got a watch that movie. In the back here. <laughs> <laughs> You're my new best friend. See, go back and watch it and count the lamps in that movie. The lamp count is crazy. Um, as far as TV shows go, um, I uh, I binged watched like all, the first five seasons of. Orange is the New Black, like on the opening weekend, they came out on Netflix, like by Saturday evening, I was done with the season. So I, I guess that makes me a super fan, even though I stopped watching like after that. But um, yeah, that was just a very enjoyable show on Netflix. I would probably say one of the best original Netflix series that they produced. Um, and like my friends would ask, why are you watching that? I'm like, well, it's a lot of fun. Why don't you check it out? So yeah, those are my picks. I'm I'm probably with uh, Jake and not not really believing in uh, a guilty pleasure. Just sort of just embrace the stuff you like. Just um, but a movie that I am just like I, I've I've accepted that I am obsessive about it. I'm just so fascinated, even though it has been just like ripped to shreds. Guys, we don't talk enough about the counselor. Like what one of the weirdest movies that has come out in like the last decade with just these like long existential like Cormac McCarthy monologues all of these big name stars doing very weird gonzo performances Ridley Scott who's basically in like full real estate porn mode it's just I that that is a movie that like I think about at least like once a month and are just like God, I, I can't believe that got made and like everyone in it it, it is just like so game and so sure that it just like so thirsty to be chewing into this material and 
it it is such a a fascinating kind of it 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 doesn't quite work but the the all the elements in it together that are so like amped up and crazy are are all the more fascinating to me um and as far as tv shows um i i just don't think you're going to find anything out there as hilarious as bar rescue i mean a a show that i i will gladly sit on my couch and eat like a bag of potato chips and watch i mean if you want to see the greatest hour of comedy in your life there there's an episode where a (laughs) where the john taffer the host of the show tries to redo a pirate bar in i believe it's downtown pittsburgh and the just the level of just like delusionment of the owners just being like no 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 this is this concept's totally working i don't i don't understand Your, your your changes are awful it is is the funniest thing you will ever watch. So that's that's my guilty or that is my admirable pleasure vote, not guilty pleasure. <laughs> I'm with you on the uh, the counselor. Have you seen the director's cut? I have. It's a legit it's, masterpiece. Yeah, that's actually the if you've never seen it, that's the version you should see because it it actually like makes some of the like weirder subplots make more sense. Um, but you still get the like. Man, they, the, the climax of this movie really is like a 15-minute monologue on like morality and how we're all just going to die one day yeah, due to our choices. Much. Yeah. It's awesome. I've never heard of Bar Rescue. I just learned a lot of things. I have to count the lamps and truth or dare. <laughs> truth or dare. Um, but yeah, I, that just reminded me, I actually used to watch Wife Swap. I think, I think that's what it's called. I did watch that when that was first on where people like that's another reality one but i don't believe in guilty pleasures either because it was funny as hell so do you think we have a another should we get one more question what's everyone think game game faces i would say so yeah all right cool well you know this mysterious trivia i don't know how i don't know how deep we're going there like how long it'll be so (laughs) i'm very intrigued I think it'll be relatively quickly now that I think about it. It's only 10 questions with a bonus question. Um, if we want to ask another general question for the group, we can do that. Or if we want to dive into trivia, we can do that too. Um, no, I'll, I'll throw out another question. Just you know, Sure. Um, and this is tough, I think, but because for me, I, can, I know there's like 20, but what's a movie or TV show that you've seen the most? You could do one or the other, but like um, over the course of your life, a movie that's just like, wow, I've probably seen that. Uh, you know, more than I can possibly count. Uh, for me, you know, there's like 10 that I know for sure I were on constant repeat, but I'm not going to dive too, too deep. But it's kind of a tiebreaker, I feel like, between Beetlejuice, uh, Ghostbusters, or the um, original Star Wars trilogy, because I watched those repeatedly. And I know I just gave like six or five technically, but don't follow my lead or just do it and be really fast. I can go. So um, uh, I'll just talk about one movie that I I know is up there in terms of seeing the most and that's Monsters Inc. And um, the reason why I I go back to that movie a lot is I find myself using that movie to, uh, using what that movie did amazingly well on to explain my issues with other films. Um, Largely, I think Monsters, Inc. is phenomenal in how it creates a completely original uh, universe. And when you create a universe, there needs to be rules. You need to establish what makes sense, what doesn't make sense, how something works. And then that needs to be integrated into the story. The story cannot work without the rules. The rules cannot work without the story. And I think there's like when I review other films, in there are times where I would notice either the premise doesn't work as well t- with the story, or the story is nice, but the story doesn't really rely on the world that they created, or vice versa. And it ends up making me talk about Monsters Inc. a lot, and it just makes me watch it again over and over again. Yeah, I'll go briefly. I'll I'll pick a movie and a show. Um, for film, I'll say, which also happens to be my favorite film. We mentioned David Lynch earlier. Um, my favorite movie that I say is, of all time is uh, Mulholland Drive. 
Um, I must have seen that movie maybe two dozen times at this point. Um, and every time I watch it, I discover something new and I see it in a different way. And um, it's it, the beauty about David Lynch is that the, like, uh, I, I forgot who mentioned this, but like, he's not really tied down to any cinematic rules or conventions and it exists in this like half dream slash half nightmare state that just is really intoxicating to watch. Um, so Mulholland drive is movie. And for a TV show, we also mentioned some anime earlier. I'm a big anime fan. And I think um, maybe the greatest art ever made is cowboy bebop, um, which also has a lot of influences in cinema. I've been through the series and the movie several times as well um i can't get enough of it and uh it's a it's episodic but it's a lot of fun so uh if you haven't seen either i would recommend them both highly well i guess uh, to keep going on with the um the anime here um i know the the one film that i've obsessed over constantly like when i first saw it as a teenager i just i could not stop watching this film was uh, was akira and Akira is a film that, like, the, the more I watch it, the more I take something more away from it, which I, I just find so, just, like, so enlightening that you can get that from, like, a film that's essentially just a big disaster film. Like, even after that, like, Otomo just basically went into doing animation that was all about, like, disasters. Like, he did work on stuff like Metropolis and Spriggan, all this big, you know, huge disaster type stuff. Um, but I noticed that he always put like huge detail into it, like detail into everything. Like if you look at like Metropolis, you notice there's ridiculous amounts of detail. Like when stuff, when buildings crash, you see everything. You see the glass, you see the pavement crack, you see people running in the distance, you see everything. But to also, you know, make that kind of like story resonate on like a more emotional, personal and spiritual level that there's something you can always take away from Akira every time you watch it. So I, I'm constantly fascinated by this film. I can't get enough of it. Um, and very quickly for television, since you mentioned David Lynch, um, Twin Peaks is on a similar plane. I, I always get something different out of Twin Peaks anytime I watch it. It's hilarious. It's horrific. It's, uh, it's, it's bizarre. It's romantic. It's melodramatic. It is absolutely everything that I want of a, out of a television series. Even the when they came back with the third season was just perfect for me, so. All right, yeah. Um, so, sorry. <laughs> um, so a couple of these I already mentioned before, like the ones that really shaped me. So I probably watched Fear and Loathing too many times that that was good for my health. Um, Alice in Wonderland as well, um, Spirited Away, which if I hear like the piano soundtrack already makes me cry. <laughs> I don't know why. It's not a sad movie necessarily, but it's just very emotional. Um, Star Wars, uh, all of them, well, not the recent trilogy. I still haven't seen Rise of uh, Skywalker yet even. Um, I should also have mentioned earlier like the favorite like the movie that people don't expect you like. I'm a Phantom Manus fan, which I knew was gonna. <laughs> so uh, that one I've also watched many, many, many times. And for TV shows, uh, Stargate SG-1 is like one of my favorite all time TV shows, Battlestar Galactica and The Nick, which is my like one of my favorite all time TV shows as well. So those are the ones I've seen many times and I don't really uh, rewatch stuff a whole lot, I have to say. So this is like, a very small list. <laughs> so say we all. Uh, for me, um, when I was a teenager, I watched Jaws all the time, um, I, as I'm sure lots of people did. But then there are like two other ones that I, I've seen. I just I watch periodically all the time. The Burbs uh, with Tom Hanks from. And I think about that movie, I think it's just like you were talking about world building earlier. It, it creates this really interesting collection of people that is just so i don't know what it is in the 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 suburbs take on this kind of metaphysical meaning in this uh, in this movie and uh and it's just very silly i love joe dante's kind of uh, sensibilities about things um and then another movie that i've just watched over and over and never get tired of is the first tremors movie um and it's almost entirely the the chemistry between uh kevin bacon and uh and uh, Fred Ward, I think that just those, I could just watch those two hang out all day uh, and, and be a very happy person. So for, yes, for, movies, it's the, <laughs> for movies, it's those. I have two favorite TV shows. Um, 
Hannibal. I love the Hannibal series. Um, I've seen all three seasons many times. But uh, the Mary Tyler Moore show is also I used to watch on Nick at Night when I was a kid. And I've never not loved the Mary Tyler Moore show. So I've, I could watch that at any, any, any time of any day, too. Uh, I don't really have a good uh, pick for TV show I've seen the most because I mostly just watch like a the full run and then I'm 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 done with it. I'm not gonna go back and see the whole thing again. Um, but as, as far as movies, it's an easy answer. It's Jurassic Park because that's the only movie every single person in my giant extended family can agree on is a good movie. So when we're inevitably home for the holidays, Jurassic Park comes on, whether it's Thanksgiving, Christmas. Easter, because that's the only thing everyone can agree on is good is Jurassic Park. Uh, yeah, I feel like for the most that I've watched, it's pretty easy answers for me as well. The, the movie I've definitely seen the most is Empire Strikes Back, just because it's hands down my favorite Star Wars, and I was obsessed with Star Wars when I was a kid, and that's when I had time to obsessively rewatch movies. Um, and then as far as TV, it's probably because I started watching it as a kid, I've seen the Twilight Zone too many times to count every episode. Awesome. I love the Twilight Zone. I was trying to think of shows that I might maybe have seen the most. I feel like it would have to be something that I just repeatedly like can always just fall into a rewatch of, which is probably like Parks and Recreation and The Office. I feel like those are those are ones I've seen a lot. Though I do rewatch my favorite shows. Like I've seen Sopranos several times through. I've seen Breaking Bad several times through. I mean, you know. And a lot of the movies that I mentioned are ones that I watched a lot as a kid. That's why I know they're the ones I've seen the most. But actually, everybody mentioned other ones as well. So there's just, just so many. I used to have like, back when uh, VHS tapes, you know, anyone remembers those? I had like four movies on one tape and they all kind of like bled into each other. So like I think of Beetlejuice, I think I had Ghostbusters and Batman, uh, Tim Burton, Batman, like all on the same tape. Um, also Lady in White, which is a very random horror movie that not a lot of people know of, but I enjoy still. I had it on that. So I always think of those together. All right. So thank you everybody for sharing. Um, so I guess uh, take it away, Jake. All right, it's time. Uh, here we go. The rules. I will ask 10 film-related questions to the group. If you know the answer, please buzz in by saying your name. A point will be awarded to a correct answer, and some questions will have the opportunity to earn a bonus point. Questions will increase in difficulty as it goes along. The person with the most points at the end wins. Are there any questions? All right. Question one. Going back to the first film I ever saw, what are the names of the seven dwarfs in Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs? Be sure to unmute your mic. What? I, I, I know them in Dutch though, probably. So I'll pass. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone? I can try. Sure, go for it. There, there's seven of them. So there's Happy, yes. there's Bashful, there's Sneezy, there's Grumpy, there's Dopey. There's Doc, and then there's one last one. Uh... How do you feel when you're tired? Oh, sleepy. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. All right. Well, good job, Kevin. You get the first points. All right. That Question. Was harder than I expected. <laughs> well, I'm sorry. I tried. Okay, here we go. No, I mean it should have been easy. You should know the seven dwarves. Oh right, like, exactly. Exactly. All I thought of, like this one might be more your speed, Christy. Um, oh. Question two: What is the haunted room number in the Overlook Hotel? Two thirty-seven. Correct. All right. <laughs> By the way, amazing documentary. Everyone should check that out. It's yeah. hilarious. Oh, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, uh, um, question three. What is uh, Tom... All right, this one, I uh, should say, uh, has a bonus point available. So, question three. What is Tom Cruise's call sign in Top Gun? And for the bonus point, who is his wingman? Maverick and Goose. Correct. Christy gets another point. And so, you probably flight. don't need a buzzing with your name. 
Yeah, so she gets a point and a bonus point. That's right. Christy is three. Kevin is one. Everybody else is here. Um, question four. How many Oscars has Meryl Streep won? And for a bonus point, how many has she been nominated for in total? Too many and not enough. I know she's won at least two. I think she's won three. Yeah, three is it's correct. probably three, yeah. Yeah. Emily, for a bonus point, do you want to take a crack at how many she's been nominated for? Uh, 18. I don't even know. I'm sorry. The correct answer is 21. Okay. Oh, oh my God. God. <laughs> I was concerned I was going too high. Yeah. All righty. Question number five. Which film originally had the tagline, You will believe a man can fly? Superman. Correct. Mark gets a point. All righty, question six. What is the highest grossing R-rated movie of all time? Uh, are we adjusting for inflation? Um, I don't believe we are adjusting for inflation, and we'll keep it domestic. Joker? Correct. Damn. Who's that? Who's that? Who said that? I'm sorry? Yeah, I, I did, yeah. Mark, perfect. Oh, Thank you very much. Gosh, really? All it right. is Joker. Oh, man. Question number seven. What is the name of Holly Golightly's cat in Breakfast at Tiffany's? Cat. Correct. <laughs> Emily, the cat enthusiast, gets it correct. All righty. Question number eight. Who was the, and this one has a bonus point. Who was the killer in the original Friday the 13th, and what did they wear on their face? Jason's mom. Ooh. We like said that simultaneously. I know. <laughs> Close. So um, what was the bonus? The bonus is what did she wear on her face? A sack? Was... I don't think she wore anything. No, she did not. That was the trick. Oh, Thank you very much. Okay. You've All been right. screamed. Um, question yeah, number yeah. nine. This one also has an opportunity for a bonus point. Name the six actors who have portrayed James Bond in the film series. And for the bonus point, name them in the order in which they first played the role. Okay, so is it it's it's Sean Connery? Yes. Then George Lazerby? Yes. Then um Roger Moore? Yes. Then Timothy Dalton? Yes. Then Pierce Brosnan and yes. then Daniel Craig. Nailed it. Nice. Yes. Yeah. All right. Here we I go, guys. I always forget um, the, the second one. I always forget his name. Or else I, would have I know. Yeah. He just showed up for one. It's one of the best, though, if you ask me. Um, all right, here we go. Question number 10, final question. If uh, we have a tie, I do have a bonus question. Question number 10, also with a bonus point. What is the longest-running film franchise? And for the bonus point, how many installments are there? Godzilla and 36. Wow, nailed it. Kevin, well, that puts you in the lead. You win four points. <laughs> Yay! Nice, like Very uh, nice. nice. You want to hear that? Do you want to take a crack at the bonus question, anyone? Bring so, it. all right, who can who can name the thirteen dwarves from The Hobbit? Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> I know Thorin. <laughs> yeah. Very good. Thorin. Yeah. Well, that oh. was trivia. Kevin, Wait, you congratulations. Said 13, right? You said there's yes. 13 of them. There's, there's 13. There's, there's Thorin. I know there's Gloin because because uh, Gimli's dad is yes. in there. And, and then the Balin's in there too. The thing to remember basically, there's that. five groups that all have rhyming yeah, names. Yeah. Yes, yes. So Gloin rhymes with. Oh my gosh. I don't, I don't even I don't know the other ones. Uh, I know I, Thorin and Gloin and Balin. And Actually, there's no way I can name. Sleepy, <laughs> but it's too far away. But I have a best set of all the all the. Uh, you have a best set. All right. Yeah. But it's well, far study up. Maybe we'll ask that question next time. No, we won't. Thirteen of them. All right. Well, congratulations, uh, Kevin. You have won our inaugural trivia Yay. game. Everyone else, good job. Thank you very much. You win well, a then. film inquiry beanie that is adorned on a. Is that a uh, Yoda doll? Yeah. very nice this is your prize Woo. that's your prize nice thank you <laughs> really cute uh, you need to pay for postage right 
awesome. Thank you so much Alrighty. for putting that together. That was that was fun. And congrats, Kevin. Awesome Thank job. You. Thank you. That was fun. We should definitely do that next time. For sure. All right. So I guess that's that's a wrap on this uh, round table. Thank you, everybody. This was like really fun and it was a nice little injection of joy <laughs> on a random Tuesday. Well, where I am Tuesday evening. I think it's too. I don't know. We might be in the matrix. I it is no Tuesday. Idea. Allegedly. <laughs> <laughs> no one knows. I know. Right. Um, anyway. So thank you everybody for participating. It was, it was really nice to see you guys and meet some of you for the first time visually. And uh, I look forward to doing another. And for anyone who watches this, thank you. Wishing everybody well. You're all in my thoughts. Um, and yeah, I'm very happy to be part of such an amazing team. So thank you again. Yeah, thank you very much, Chrissy. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Good to be thank working you. with all of you. Thanks, everyone.